good morning, KCC. Uh, thanks for joining us here on our stream of the service. I'm going to, uh, full disclosure here, um, we're actually recording this on Saturday morning, and we're doing that for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, um, we were communicating, or more specifically, Tim was communicating uh, with other churches, and apparently a whole bunch of churches, uh, probably thousands of churches around our country, are going to be trying this, and many of them for the first time. We didn't know how Facebook Live was going to be able to handle all of those, so we thought it would be best if we recorded everything and then uploaded it so that you could watch it uh, tomorrow on Facebook or on YouTube if you like. And so we're actually recording this the day before. The second reason we're doing that is that we actually have a team of people here uh, making sure that this can happen. We want them to be able to worship at home with their families as well. Um, so I hope that's okay. You'll be able to watch this uh, when you like to. You can do it at 9 and 1030, just keeping with our regular times or however you see fit. A couple of things I want to let you know about. We had some exciting things happen this week. Uh, Caitlin Weir and Shannon Bell were baptized into Christ this week, which is awesome. God continues to move into the life of our people as people are accepting and surrendering to Him and acknowledging and confessing Him as Lord. Um, and it's just been a great year to see so many people surrender their lives to Jesus. So we want to congratulate Caitlin and Shannon for the decisions that they've made. This is normally a life group week, and uh, the elders are meeting on Sunday evening, and one of the topics that we will discuss is whether or not to continue to encourage our life groups to meet. So you might check with your life group leader to see if your meeting will continue to communicate through our website page, uh, or our website, kccwired.com, or on Facebook. If you go to Facebook and put in KCC Wired, Kalkaska Church of Christ, you'll be able to see this information. And so if you don't have access to those things, uh, obviously, keep in touch with your neighbors, or if you know someone that doesn't really have access to a computer, make sure you're letting them know, keeping them in the know about things happening uh, with the church. Well, with our service today, um, we're going to jump right into things, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Brandon Jenkins, and he's going to do our communion meditation for us. So as I do that, um, if you want to hit pause and grab your grape juice and bread, or if you've already got it there for you, that's awesome. Uh, but I'm going to turn it over to Brandon, and he's going to give our communion, communion meditation for us this morning. Brandon? Good morning, church family and friends. I know there's been a lot of crazy things going on in the world the last few weeks, and uh, I know it can sometimes uh, get us involved in all the things going on in the world, and uh, sometimes it's hard to break away from that and get ourselves focused on what God wants us to do. And so with all the struggles I found with my time that I've been trying to focus on God, and in my focusing on God, instead of asking God for the selfish things, I've been thanking God for all of the wonderful gifts that he's given us in life. And one of the greatest gifts that he's given us is Jesus. And knowing that he gave us Jesus to pay the price for our sins. It says in John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave us his only Son, and for those that believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So this morning, as we gather around the table together, I just want to do this and go into our communion and do it as all in. This is all about Jesus. Let's just cast out all the worldly things and focus on Jesus alone. So we'll take our bread together. That represents the body that was nailed to the cross for our sins. And we, I'm going to say a prayer, and we will take the cup together after the prayer that represents his blood pouring out. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time as a church family that we can still gather together at your table. And I just ask that you put Jesus and Jesus alone in our hearts this morning that we remember the sacrifice that he had for us, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks, Brandon, I appreciate that. Have you, uh, you know, before we dive in here, let's, uh, let me just pray for us one more time, because I think in uh, the midst of all of the, 
I don't know, if fear is the right word, anxiety, curiosity about what's going to happen with all this coronavirus stuff, um, I, I want to make sure that we absolutely do not neglect going to God in prayer and uh, lifting up our uh, nation, our world to Him, and just asking Him to watch over us and to protect us. So let's, let's, just, let's just pause for a second and pray. Father, um, thank You. Uh, thank You for life. Uh, thank You for the joy of getting to live life. Uh, thank You for our church. Um, thank You for giving us uh, not just the resources, but the technology to be able to do what we're doing this morning, that when we're in a time where um, something that could bring uh, physical ailment to people, that we could pause and say, okay, how can we redeem this moment and still have church in this and being able to stream this so that people can have it in their homes to be able to worship together. And Lord, my prayer so much right now is that uh, even more people that would show up on a Sunday are worshiping You right now that they're getting ready to open up your word, that they've just taken communion together, and that they're just pouring themselves out before you, and that we just have a great revival that takes place because of what's going on in our churches, uh, even this month, Lord God. Uh, Father, please protect us, protect our leaders as they make important decisions. I pray that they're working according to your will, um, and that they're seeking guidance and counsel that comes from you. And so that from this, Father, we can come out a stronger world, a stronger nation, a stronger country, a stronger people as we continue to serve and to thrive to be the children of God you've created us to be. Uh, we love you, Father. As we dive into your word now, please open our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this is obviously a little, a little odd, um, but I have to tell you also on Saturday mornings, I'm used to being here uh, practicing to an empty room. And I can get just as animated, and as you can see now, I'm still, I just caught myself looking around the room as though there are people here, even though they're not. So I'm going to do that. I'm probably not going to stare in the camera. I'll do the best that I can. Um, but uh, this is kind of my normal on a, on a Saturday morning, getting ready, for, uh, getting ready for worship. I have this question for you. Do you ever, or have you, do you have friends that uh, say in five minutes what they could say in five seconds? Some of you are thinking, yes, I have a preacher like that. I listen to him every Sunday morning. He says in about 40 minutes what we could hear in 15. Okay, that's funny. Um, I understand that. But do you have one of those friends that they just seem to go on and on and on when it's like you're just saying, man, get to the point. I got stuff to do. I got people to see. I got to, you know, get out and, and do my thing. And I think that we've all probably had those friends. And we probably, if we don't have those friends, we probably are that friend. I know that, that I have been that uh, person before. How many of you have those friends that know just the wrong thing to say at just the wrong time? You have those friends that, and probably the best example is when somebody loses somebody. Um, they just have a loss in their family and someone comes up and says, well, they're in a better place. That's really the last thing you want to hear in that moment. You know, you think that you're bringing comfort, but the fact is it's just cliche and I just don't want to hear that right now. Uh, my wife works uh, in, a, nurse, or in a, a funeral home. And at the funeral home, um, she had to get into the practice, and she's been trying to teach me that when you walk into a funeral home, the last thing you want to say some, to somebody is, hi, how are you? Uh, because it's the obvious. They're not doing well. You know, they just are grieving, they're mourning, and then just out of our mouth comes, hey, how you doing today, right? Um, and it just becomes a, a habit sometimes. And we know just what the wrong thing is to say at sometimes just the wrong time. A lot of cliches and a lot of people just meaning well, but just maybe not speaking the way that we need them to in that particular moment. We're in this book of Job, and we've entitled the sermon series, A War Within. And if you were with us uh, last week, um, we're uh, with this book of Job. We have this guy named Job. He's very wealthy. He's got all kinds of stuff. He's got building, land, animals, 10 kids, seven boys and three daughters. Um, and he's got a wife, of course. And he's just wealthy. He's got, he's got it all. And it says in the Bible that he fears God and he turns away from evil. He's a very actionable man when it comes to his faith. And we, then we uh, switch over and we have this picture that God calls together this holy staff meeting and all the angels come together and Satan comes as well. And he says, well, where have you come from, Satan? And uh, Satan uh, basically says just what it says in Peter, um, that he's been prowling around like a lion looking for someone to devour. And as he does that, God says, well, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him in all the earth. And Satan says, well, sure, God, he's like that because you've given him everything. He's got everything that you can imagine. Why would he not serve you when you've given him all this stuff and put this hedge of protection around him? And in that moment, God gives him permission 
to touch all of his stuff, to take everything that he has, but he says don't touch him personally or physically, or don't touch him physically. And we have this picture of this realm that we cannot see in what takes place, that when things are going rough for us, when we're dealing with these valleys and these obstacles and this stuff in our life, we can now almost imagine what's taking place. Things were going well, and Satan is trying to separate me from God. He's trying to get me to turn on the God that created me and has blessed me and watched over me. And that's what happened with Job. And in this very brief moment of time, four things happen. His buildings collapse, his land is burned up, and people steal all of his animals. And then worst of all, his children die. All ten of his children die. But even with all of that taking place in Job's life, it says that he falls down and he worships. He falls down and he worships. He pours himself out before God, even in this disastrous moment. Well, the next snapshot that we have is that God once again has all the angels come before him, and then Satan comes in, he's like, where have you been? Looking for someone to devour. Hey, have you considered my servant Job? You incited me against him, Satan, but he still has not turned on me. And Satan said, well, sure, because a man will do anything for his own life, as if to say his children were not as important as his own life. Well, you and I know that as parents, that that's not the truth, is it? We'd give our own life for, for our children to be able to live. I think every parent would say that. But that's not what Satan says about Job. And uh, God says, all right, you can touch him, but don't kill him. And so the last picture that we have of Job is that he's covered in boils, he's sitting in ash, and his wife comes up to him and says, why don't you just curse God and die? The closest person to him on this earth tells him to turn on God. That's the place where we left Job. Well, in the next several chapters, and I'm talking like 29 chapters of Job, and I'm not going to read them all for you, I promise. <laughs> um, that would make the service really long. But in the next 29 chapters of Job, we're going to have this dialogue, this dialogue that happens between Job and these three friends that we're about to be introduced to. These friends that come around Job, and they want to be friends for him, and then they start this conversation and this dialogue, and this is the difficulty about those 28 or 29 chapters. If you or I were just to randomly pick one of those and start reading the conversation between Job and that friend, I'm willing to bet that you and I, because I know I have, would read it and say, well, that sounds like good wisdom. That sounds like good advice. That sounds like truth. But at the end, what we'll read here just in a second, is that it wasn't. And so we're having difficulty reading this because, one, it's kind of hard to read. It's written in a poetic form that's kind of difficult to follow. And as we're reading it, we're like, well, that kind of sounds good. But then this is what we read in Job 42, all right? So a little bit of a spoiler alert. This is the end of, of Job. Um, in verses 7 through 9, it says this, After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, those are words we'll get to in a couple weeks, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore, take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly." For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, some great names there, by the way, if any of you are pregnant, went and did what the Lord had told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. So at the end, we know, all right, knowing that God speaks truth, knowing that the word of God is true and it's unfallible, so it cannot be with error. That what God is saying is that what these guys spoke is not truth and is not good and is not right. So when we read through the conversations and the dialogue that Job has with his friends, we can make the assumption because what God says, so not even an assumption, we can just know that what Job is speaking is right and what his friends are speaking is wrong. We can go ahead and say that because of what God said. 
But again, the difficulty is if you hadn't read that part first, a lot of what we read about what his friends say seem like truth, and that's important to keep in mind. And so we have his friends um, that are going to come around him, and what I wanted to do this morning is to talk um, for the next few minutes about what it means to build an army of friends around us, to be in that kind of community, and what those friends should look like and what that dialogue should look like when it comes to surrounding us with a community that will honor and glorify God as opposed to make assumptions and judgments about Him. Well, as we start uh, Job chapter 3, or at the end of Job uh, chapter 2, this is what takes place. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, all the evil was all his stuff wiped away, and he's been physically affected, they came each from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite. As a side note, only one of those places is kind of familiar to experts. We don't really know what direction or how far these guys had come. But they made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept. They tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great." So here's the picture that we have. Job had some great friends. He had some great friends in this way. They heard about what had happened. How they heard, I don't know. But they heard not only that all this stuff had gone away, but he has boils all over his body. And they made an appointment and said, listen, we need to go to our friend Job. We need to go see what's taking place, what's going on with his life. And so they made an appointment and they went to see him. Now, it's easy for us to think, okay, jump in a car, train, plane, you know, whatever to get somewhere. But if we go to their context and this time in history, we have to say that that journey was probably not an easy one. Take away roads and say that what, how long would it take to ride a camel or to walk from here to Mancelona or here to Traverse City or here to Grand Rapids? Could be days. And these guys, because they heard about their friend, and I would say that towns were scattered fairly uh, far in between uh, at that point, that they got together, made an appointment, and made the rugged journey to be with their friend. Man, that's some awesome friendship. But when they saw him, they couldn't even recognize him because of the boils all over his body. I think I have this visual of just, you know, boil here, boil there, boil there, whatever. But this is to the point where he was unrecognizable by his friends when they approached my wife has a cousin, and uh, he went to college in Pennsylvania, and his family lived in Ohio. And uh, when he was at college, he decided to do something, I think on his ceiling or above the door or something, but he needed more height, so it was a, a room that was fairly tall. And he took a table, and then he put a chair on top of the table, and in climbing up to do whatever he was trying to do, he fell and crashed and just busted his face all up. I mean, needed dental work the whole nine yards. And I heard that when he drove home, and he went to his parents' door, and his dad opened the door. His dad looked at him and just wept. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation where you knew somebody that maybe was in an accident or sick or whatever, and something took place on their body, but you looked and it was like, I can't even recognize you. You don't look the same as you did before in what your reaction was. But in this moment, his friends didn't even recognize him. And they just began to weep, to weep, and they tore their robes. And then it was kind of interesting. The Bible tells us that they sat down, and they just sat there for seven days, just staring at each other. Well, a couple of things that we see in these few verses that I think are very commendable for these friends of Job, and that as you build an army of friends around you, and as you're part of that army as well, is that, number one, a friend has your back. A good friend has your back. And by that, I'm not talking about in a fight that they're there to protect you in some weird situation, but I mean a good friend. If you're going to surround yourself with people that are going to point you in a direction that God would have you go, they're going to have your back. Meaning that when some kind of trial, travesty, trouble is taken over, they're going to be there for you. They're going to be there for you. When these guys heard that this Awful things were happening to Job, and especially the loss of his kids. 
they said, hey, we need to go care for our friend. And they came, and they were there. And not only that, they sympathized with him in that they saw him from a distance, didn't even recognize him, and tore the robes just weeping for him because it had happened to them? No, but because they were such good friends, they could just feel what was happening to him. It was almost an empathy as opposed to a sympathy because they were looking at him think, oh, I can't imagine the pain. I don't know. I wish I could have been here to help or to receive that news for you. And I can't imagine what you're going through right now and just tearing their robes and weeping with them. And why? Because good friends have your back and they're there for you. They feel what you feel. They sympathize and empathize and they show mercy and kindness and they want to be there for you. The second thing that I noticed in this, and, and I mentioned it a second ago, is that a good friend gives his or her ear to you as well. They give you their ear. After they saw Job and they tore their robes and they wept, the Bible says that they sat there again in a circle looking at each other for seven days. It doesn't tell us that they ate. It doesn't tell us that they drank. It just tells us that they sat there with each other for seven days. Now, if we were gathering today, I was going to do this little exercise where we just sat in silence for just two minutes, just two minutes. And I don't know if you've ever done this. I know a lot of you would like to do this with your kids. Maybe even right now you'd like to do that with your kids. I don't know. But I know that two minutes can seem like an hour because we're used to noise. Some of us even have noise machines going on so that we can sleep. We just need noise, something going on in our ears. And they just sat there in silence. When I was in seminary, I had a a class called Spiritual Disciplines, and with Spiritual Disciplines, uh, those are things like praying, uh, giving, uh, worshiping, uh, reading your Bible, um, fasting, Uh, those are all spiritual disciplines. There's another one that's not really popular, but we decided, or a professor decided that we would practice it that day, and it's called Silence and Solitude. So we actually, for about three, three and a half hours, told us to go find a place in the church, that's where our class was meeting. And he said, find a place where there's no one else around, and I just want you to sit in silence for, I think it was three hours, maybe three and a half hours. Nothing. Just sit there in silence. Now, in that time in my life, some of you know about my whole eye thing, and I can't see well out of my left eye. It was right at the beginning stages of that where I was seeing blurry. I hadn't had my first eye doctor appointment. I had no idea what was going on. Did I have a brain tumor? I didn't know what was going on. I knew that my job at our last church was coming to an end, and so I had the anxiety of that just all rushing through my head, and I'm supposed to sit here in silence listening for God when I just wanted to yell and scream and cry out and say, what is going on? But I think that's the problem sometimes. We have trouble sitting in silence because we're still focusing on us. We're still focusing on our problems and what's going on instead of trying to listen for God. And I would say in this moment that When Job and his friends were sitting down in a circle for seven days, that they weren't just trying to complain or point fingers or whatever, they were just listening. And they were trying to hear from God in that moment to say, what's going on? And sometimes our army of friends, we just need to be silent before God sometimes and just seek Him and just listen for Him as well. Well, this is where it gets a little more tricky. Because those great characteristics of his friends, things that you and I should look for when it comes to being in an army of friends, not just when it's all about us and our army, but being in an army of friends, um, and being in an army meaning sometimes that you have to attack Satan and approach the throne of God and the gates of heaven and say, Lord, we want to pray and lift this thing up, all right? So I'm talking about that kind of vigor and mentality of, of, hey, how do we attack life and be the people God's created us to be? But when it comes to having that group, do you have each other's back? Are you there for one another in the great times in life, but also in the sorrowful times of life? And secondly, are you willing just to listen? And to listen without judgment. Listen allowing someone to speak, even though it may come out, some some venom may come out, some things that you don't want to hear, but sometimes people just have to get it off their back. So this is what happens with Job. He speaks first. He speaks first, and his first speech is about how he wished the day that he were born never existed. That's the essence of his first talk. I wish that I was never born. I hope that you've never been in that place, but I'm willing to guess 
that many of us have been. We've had those days where maybe not all the stuff that Job had to deal with, but yes, a whole lot of junk from this world, where there are just days that we're like, you know what, I wish I was never a part of this whole thing. <laughs> I wish I was never born. I don't know that I personally have ever been there. I know that I've been in a place where I'm like, you know, Lord, if, uh, if uh, Jesus were to come back right now, it wouldn't be the worst thing for me. <laughs> I've been there, and I would guess that many of us have as well. And what I want to tell you is that I believe Job was not correct in saying that because God has a plan for you. God has a wonderful plan in life mapped out for you. More importantly, He has an eternity for you. And if you were never born, it means you would never get to experience eternity with Him. And so while Job is lamenting so much so that he's like, oh, I wish the day that I was born was never here, I don't think he really meant that he wished he was never born because he got to experience a lot of great things in life. And he has a loving father that even was complimenting his faith in who he was as a man of God. Well, as he's doing this, his friends are going to respond. And again, keeping in mind what God said about what his friends said, I just want to share a few excerpts from what his friends said and kind of point out what their reaction to Job's situation was. For example, in Job chapter 4, from his friend Eliphaz, it says this, Remember, who that was innocent ever perished? Or where were the upright cut off? As I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. By the breath of God they perish, and by the blast of His anger they are consumed. He goes on, As for me, and this is a chapter later, I would seek God, and to God would I commit my cause who does great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. He gives rain on the earth and sends waters on the fields. He sets on high those who are lowly, and those who mourn are lifted to safety. His friend Bildad said this, If your children have sinned against him, he has delivered them into the hand of their transgression. That goes over well at a funeral. Well, yeah, they died because they sinned. If you will seek God and plead with the Almighty for mercy, if you are pure and upright, surely then He will rouse Himself for you and restore your rightful habitation. And from his friend Zophar in chapter 11, Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves, for He knows worthless men. When He sees iniquity, will He not consider it? You see, the message that Job's friends had for him, if you were to summarize all the speeches that they give, and there were some eight speeches between the three of them that they give in Job's direction, this is how you would summarize it. Job, it's because you sinned. It's your fault. Because God is just. And if God is just, none of this bad stuff would happen. Does that sound familiar? I mean, how many of us want to look at bad things that happen and say, well, it's just because sin, it's because we've sinned or whatever, but then we go to Job chapter 1 and say, no, sometimes it's God saying, you know what, Satan, have your way, but I'm telling you, it'll test their faith, but they will not turn on me. But Job's friends instead want to say to him, listen, it's because of what you did, it's because of your sin, you deserve all of what's happening to you, because we serve a just God, and that just God is going to make sure that good things happen to good people, and bad things have to... uh, bad things have to happen to bad people, and they have to suffer the consequences for the bad things that they have done. I'm here to tell you that if your army that you're in has people with that kind of wisdom and advice, you need to find a new army. You need to find a new army. If the advice that you're getting from people is it's all your fault, and they just want to cast judgment and throw stones at you and the decisions that, you're, uh, that you've made and call you a sinner, when we know that Job was, he was an upright man, he feared God, he resisted evil, this was not his problem. If the army around you is just continuing to say, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault, you probably would feel like Job who said, I wish then that I was never born. And so those are not great qualifi- or characteristics or qualities of the army that you want to surround yourself with. So stick with the good parts of these guys. They were willing to run. They were willing to be there when Job needed them. They're willing to weep and mourn with him. They're willing to sit with him. They're willing to listen to him. And those are great things. But then they kind of went off the rails a little bit with the things that came out of their mouth. It reminds me of this uh, story in John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, 
uh, Jesus was passing by and he saw a man blind from birth. And I don't know if you remember this or not, but his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was, more, it was not this man that sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Does that not sound like the same situation? Does that not sound like the same idea that his friends are coming and saying, all right, God, um, did Job sin or did his parents sin that has, he's having to deal with this? And God's saying, no, it's not about his sin. This is about my works being displayed through him. So I wanted to take just the last few minutes to talk about what are a couple of other qualities that these guys didn't show that we should be looking for in a friend. And I want to do so from John chapter 13. In John chapter 13, a very famous uh, account of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. In fact, the third point on the outline is that a good friend washes your feet. A good friend washes your feet. Because this is what happened. In John 13, they're coming, Jesus is like hours before his death. But during supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, all that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. He poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Did you notice in the story of Job that his friends came, great, they listened, they sat in silence with him, and then they listened to him talk. But when does it ever say that they got up to care for his wounds? When does it ever say that they said, bring us some water, some towels, let us dab those for us? When does it say that even though he had boils, that they gave him a hug and said, we're not going to let that stop us from letting you know how much we love you and care for you, Job? When in the story does it say that they served him? And the answer is it doesn't. They came with all kinds of words and all kinds of supposed wisdom, but they didn't come serving their friend who obviously was sitting in a world of pain and sorrow, and that their service to him was just words accusing him of being a sinner. And when it comes to us having this army of friends and being a part of an army of friends, we need to make sure that we're washing each other's feet. We're caring and serving for one another. I had a life group uh, that when we were in Indiana, and I had uh, lost my job and been out of work for quite a while, and life group family after life group family kept coming and bringing us gift cards and uh, just financially helping us get through a very difficult time for my family and me. I had a friend that came and wrote a couple of big checks and said, listen, don't jump at the first job that comes along. Go where God is calling you to go. And these are the kind of friends that didn't just see our situation and weep with us and sit in a circle and listen to us while that would have been okay, but they didn't start casting judgment about how awful my actions were and didn't do this and didn't do this. Instead, they said, let us serve you. And we need to be those same kind of friends that when we see people hurting, that we're able to and that we do serve them. The other thing that I would point out from this account of Jesus washing his disciples' feet is that a good friend offers leadership. A good friend offers leadership. In that same John 13 chapter, it says, do you understand what I have done to you? Jesus talking, of course. You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. We need to serve one another but we also need to lead one another. What Jesus did after washing his disciples' feet is he didn't just leave it out there. He said, listen, do you understand what I've done? I served you, and that's what you need to do for each other. You need to serve one another. That was leadership. Jesus was letting them know that if you want to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven, you're going to be the servant of all. And when it comes to being in an army of friends, and either surrounding yourself with friends or being a part of an army of friends, we need to make sure that we're not just serving each other well, but we're leading each other to the throne, that we're leading each other to Jesus. You see, Job's friends, they decided that they would 
let Job know what they thought. Well, it's because you sinned, it must be, because God wouldn't do this for somebody that was sinless. I mean, that's not how it works. Why wouldn't they instead say, you know what, Job, I don't have an explanation for you. I can guess, but I don't know if it's right. But instead, let's focus on what God wants in all of this. Let's focus on the message, the training, the teaching, the test, whatever it is that God's trying to sharpen us with in this moment, let's focus on those things. That's leadership. Leadership among your friends coming around you is not looking at you and saying, you know, if you hadn't made those bad decisions, then you wouldn't be in that situation you're in. They instead would say, listen, regardless of what's been, let's look ahead. Let's look to see what God has in store for you. Let's see what Jesus had in mind for you as one of his disciples, as one of his followers, as one of his children. Let's focus on that going forward. With this whole coronavirus thing, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. I kind of have the mindset that, yes, eventually it's getting up here. That it's just everybody's going to be infected or affected by it in some way, shape, or form. And they're just trying to lengthen things so that the hospital system or the healthcare system is not overwhelmed by it. That eventually it's getting here. But regardless, it still is going to affect me. Even if it never gets here, it's going to affect our community. The economy is starting to, I mean, the stock market's going down and no bread on the shelves. It was crazy at the grocery store yesterday. All kinds of things that are happening. And so we need to have our eyes open with our army of friends to say, where in our community are we going to need to invite another friend into our circle and love on them, care for them, and point them to Jesus? This isn't the time to say, well, I'm not helping you because you don't go to church. Now is the time to say, listen, I know you're hurting. I have an answer, and his name is Jesus. Now is the time to expand our friend circle to include people that are going to be affected by this situation, losing their job, school's out, child care is going to be a mess for the next three or four weeks. These are our opportunities to serve our community and to serve our neighbors well. How are we going to step into that not making accusations, not pointing fingers, not casting judgment, but instead just leading people well by pointing them to Jesus and serving one another. In our times of uncertainty, how can we be a friend that protects, listens, serves, and leads? How can we be friends that protect, that listen, that serve, and that lead others? In Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10, the last thing I'll share with you, it says this, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and is not another to lift him up. Folks, we were made to be in community. We were made to be in friendship. God himself is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The first church didn't just gather at the temple. They also gathered in each other's homes daily, breaking bread together, fellowshipping, praying, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, pouring themselves out. They were there. They they sold all the stuff that they had to take the money to help each other as they had need. That's who God created us to be. And so this lesson from Job and his friends is we have that, man, they were great friends and that they came to the rescue and they were absolutely the army of friends he needed and they listened well to what Job had to say. But where they fell short is that we also need to be friends that serve and bring wisdom and light and truth to the situation and point people to Jesus. We can play the blame game and point fingers and cast judgment all we want. But the fact of the matter is this, that's not going to bring people to Jesus. What brings people to Jesus is when we protect each other, when we listen to each other, when we serve one another, and when we lead one another to be the men and God, men and women of God that he's created us to be and that Jesus has called us to be. Hey, thank you so much for listening today. I'm so grateful that you uh, tuned in, turned us on, whatever that you did uh, to be able to watch the service today. I pray that you're having a rich, rich time of worship with your family and maybe some friends over. I don't know what that looks like for you, but I pray that it's just a great time, and I hope after this that you'll just take time to pray. Pray for our community and pray 
to ask God where He would point you to work in our current situation, to know what it looks like to be the people of God in our community so that we can see a revival take place and more and more people coming to know who Jesus is, more and more people joining this army of friends that protect, that listen, that serve, and that lead one another. I love you guys. Let's pray. Father, thank you again so much for your word. Thank you for the life of Job that we could dive into. Father, we thank you for his friends and how they initially reacted. And and we want friends like that that will be there for us. We want friends that will listen and that will just mourn with us. But Father, I pray that we would take it the next step and not be the friends that you would blast someday for saying, man, you gave some bad advice, but instead that we would be the friends that would, that would serve our friends that are in need and that would lead them well and lead them toward you again so that more and more people would come to know you as Lord and Savior. Father, show us where you're working so that we can be those friends to our community and to our neighbors, especially now. It's in Jesus' name that we ask it with all of our might. Amen. Thanks, guys. Hey, guys, I know that uh, you're not here so that we can physically take up an offering. Um, However, um, it is an aspect of worship, okay? Um, It's not something that we're putting out there because we're about to shut our doors financially or anything. Um, But we're putting it out there because it is an act of worship um, that we do. And so we put together a quick video that after I'm done talking here, we'll show you. It'll give you a snapshot of what's happening in our lower level with the construction project. Um, But I wanted to, before we did that, let you know that you're still able to give. Um, If you want to give of your tithes and offerings, you can do it in a couple of different ways. During the week, the offices are still open. If you want to drop by and uh, bring your offering, we'll put it in the safe and it'll be counted later in the week. Um, If you want to send it through the mail, it's P.O. Box 757, Kalkaska, Michigan, 49646. You can also give online at kccwired.com, or you can text to give in a number that you should be seeing below me right now. Those are some different ways that you can still give of your tithes and offerings, and remember the project as well for over and above offerings with our Cornerstone project. Now take a look at that video we've made for you. Hey, church family. I wanted to take a few minutes to walk you through our construction project and all the things that are taking place and why we are doing those. I wanted to start up here because if you'll see behind me, we have this wall that Ashley Oliver has painted for us. We realized that when people came in, especially guests, they weren't able to necessarily know where to take their elementary and uh, high school students, youth students. So we decided to paint this wall in a way that will let people know where they're supposed to go, but also add some color so that families and kids see that this is going to be a fun place to be and they want the, and so that their kids want to be here. All right, so I'm going to take you on a tour of downstairs, so just go ahead and follow me. As we go down the stairs, Ashley is also going to paint these walls, uh, different colors, again, just making it a welcoming environment for the kids as they get ready to come down to uh, kid stuff and uh, the part of the church building that will be specially designed just for them. As one consultant put it, we want kids dragging their parents to church and then their parents having to drag them away from church because they're having so much fun. Ashley has already started her design here. Um, to again welcome the kids as they come down the stairs. So I, right now I know that it's a bit of a mess as you take a look at everything, so you just try to have to visualize things with me. But when uh, you came down before, we had a children's library library here, and then this big open space. So the problem with the big open space is that before we started constructing all of this, if we put a child in the middle of this room, there were five different ways that that child could escape. Two, three, four, and then upstairs uh, as well. So we thought about this and planned and talked with some different people and said, how can we design a space that is more uh, safe for the kids but also that a space that just screamed, kids, we want you to come and play here and to learn about Jesus here and to have fun here and be in community here. And so all the colors were this beige and things, and then we painted the, the far wall that we'll get to in a minute. 
But we thought, okay, what if we designed the space in such a way where each of the areas had their own space that we could decorate just for them and provide that safe and secure environment for the kids. So right behind, in front of me over here is gonna be the youth area. If you remember before, the youth would go down the hallway, but they would have to walk all the way through all the kids' activities in order to get to their room. So we have this space that when you first come down the stairs, this is the youth area, middle school and high school. And the light's not on in here. So we'll see what, uh, what you're able to see. But we're gonna have uh, televisions on this wall and the teaching will take place from up here. Um, yes, I'm sure, kids, if you're watching, we might have some stuff for video games um, just to kind of get some fellowship and have some fun going on. Uh, but the TVs will be here more for the teaching and instruction, and someone will be able to teach from up here. We'll have chairs or couches over there for the kids to, uh, for the youth to sit in. Uh, over in this area, we're going to have a coffee, hot chocolate type bar um, that they can have their own uh, area to be able to come down and have uh, coffee and hot chocolate and that kind of thing. They have their own restroom that will be part of their room as well. And right in here, we'll probably have some high top tables with two or three chairs around each also. The floors, um, I think the plan right now is to have uh, a laminate put down, but it looks really cool. It'll look like wood grain floors. Uh, we wanted to do that so that if we do have more snacks and drinks and that kind of thing, they'll be easier to clean up with a hard floor as opposed to having carpet. So I'm really excited for the high school and middle school to have their own space and to have it decorated just for them and also um, more space than what they had before. Or this way, one of the things that we realized in our initial design is there wasn't a lot of place for storage. And so um, we did find a place for storage at the end of the preschool area, which I'll show you in a second. But this area, um, right now, if Sarah has vacation Bible school stuff that they put together, we're having to take it out to the trailer, uh, where now she'll be able to bring it into the storage area. Easy to pull out, easy to put in, and lots of space to be able to put those things. So that'll be nice for her. Uh, down there, we do have a family restroom, um, so that if families need to go in to use the restroom, um, they'll be able to access that through that hallway. So right over here is the safety and secure part when it comes to our kids. Right here will be a check-in for both preschool and for elementary school. So any families that come in with their kids, the parents will, or guardians will bring them to this check-in area. They'll check them in, and then from here, we'll just take them into their classrooms either way. So adults, unless you're volunteering, this is a no adult zone, all right? Only for volunteers that have their kids come in. We'll take the kids, safe and secure area, to come in both ways. This will be the preschool area. And uh, don't tell the youth or the elementary kids, but the preschoolers are ending up like the champs in this whole thing. They went from one small classroom to this big, huge area, which is going to be great. They'll have their own bathroom. They'll have their countertop and sink. They have a storage closet for their supplies. And again, we're going to paint this in a way that will obviously reflect preschool age kids and that the preschoolers will have fun. Um, we are here also going to have um, harder floors uh, with that laminate that looks like wood grain um, only because if they have spills and things, it'll be easy to clean up here also. But we'll put some of those thick padding, those foam uh, pads um, in the areas that will be designated for play for them. And then we'll have table and chairs uh, for the instruction, the kids uh, to be able to be taught by their teachers as well. So I'm really excited about this space because we're having a lot of, we've had a lot of babies born over the last couple of years. And as they become preschoolers, we're going to have an awesome space for them. Uh, to come and to learn about Jesus and to run around and play and just uh, really grow up knowing each other better and being in good community. <clears throat> Down this hallway, where it used to be our youth area for middle school and high school, this will be the baby pantry. Uh, they're going to take that over and so they'll be able to put their things uh, in there and not have to tear it down and set it up every time they open. Uh, but they'll be able to leave things set up as they are, and it'll make it a lot easier for them uh, as well. And then this is the area for elementary school. Uh, Sarah's plan is to have a television here for any kind of video that she'll need to teach with. 
Um, but that's, she'll do her instruction from here from a big group standpoint. She'll have her little circle rubs out so that the kids can see her and that she can teach them and talk with them. We still have classrooms so that they can break up into their age groups, um, either for faith training hour um, or uh, if they just need to break up into small groups. And again, this will be decorated and painted, reflecting kind of uh, Ashley will take this design and kind of carry it throughout uh, all, of the, all of the walls that are in here as well. Sarah will be able to put some more furniture and play things in here for um, in-between services and that kind of thing. And so uh, I really needed to, once I started framing things, I needed to come down and see this because in my mind before we started all this, I thought, okay, is this enough space? But once I got down here and looked around and even with the drywall up, I think it's going to be plenty of space uh, for the kids that she has uh, and room to grow with more kids uh, as well. So I'm excited about Sarah's space and she'll be able to access through double doors that way the bathrooms um, and then of course they'll have the check-in area over here so we've limited um, by 60 percent the different places that the kids could escape and now it's just a matter of uh, having uh, volunteers at at that door by that door and, and the sign-in check-in area as well and then the final spot i want to show you One of the areas that we really serve our community well is this big open space. And again, before they started framing it, I thought, okay, uh, I really hope that we're leaving enough space to be able to have funeral dinners, um, chamber of commerce uh, dinners, any of those kinds of things that come up that we're able to serve our community. But as you can see, we gained a bunch of space with the stage being taken out. Um, we went to the, the set of columns that were right here. And so this space, I think the... Um, the design, the engineer said that it could handle 220 adults, I believe. Um, and so there is plenty of room for big funeral dinners. Rarely do we have any that are bigger than that. Um, and uh, we're going to have plenty of space. I think we're going to make this the front of the room uh, because we'll have television monitors up there for any kind of video instruction that's being done or slideshows and that kind of thing. And then we'll have, of course, access to the kitchen still and just plenty of room to be able to put up tables and chairs or for larger events. Um, so we'll continue to be able to, we'll, we will be able to continue serving our community um, with this larger open space. Now, I wanted to bring you on this tour for a couple of different reasons. Number one, to show you the progress that's being made and to outline and share with you what we're doing and why we're doing those things as well. The second reason I wanted to share that with you, especially this morning, is that um, this whole project, we're able to cover about two thirds of it with cash that we have on hand. The project with furniture and everything is gonna be roughly $150,000. We're taking $100,000 out of our savings and the other 50,000, we're asking you if with your over and above offerings, you would help us pay for this um, and to do so by Easter, which is April 12th this year. And so we're asking again, if you would be willing to give over and above your regular offering, tithes and offerings to be able to help with this project. To date, we have brought in about $13,000 toward that $50,000 goal. So that's another $37,000 to go. So as you consider that and pray about that, there's a couple of different ways that you can give toward it. You can give online at kccwired.com. When you do, put in the memo line that it's for the Cornerstone Project. If you, when we are able to start gathering together again, if you want to write a, a check or if you send a check through the mail, we'll talk about that in a second, put in the memo line, Cornerstone, and those monies will go toward that. Or you can text to give, and if you look below in this video, you'll see a number that you can text to give um, if you prefer to give that way also. And again, we're hoping by Easter to be able to raise that whole $50,000 to take care of this project. Hey, thanks again. I hope that outlines for you what our project is looking like and how it's coming along. And if you have any questions, you of course can comment on the uh, Facebook post on the video post below, uh, or you can always call or the church or email us as well. Thanks guys.